Let's go. Let's go. Oh, no. Do you want to? Sorry. I'll let you. I'll let you. Next one. I'm excited and I feel relaxed and I'm ready to party. Don't say sorry. You don't need to do that. You don't need to apologize. It's a fucked up female habit. You don't need to be sorry for anything ever. Can you guess what every woman's worst nightmare is? I don't have rage issues! I have nothing to prove to you. When I'm good, I'm very good. But when I'm bad, I'm better. I say when it comes to stardom and Lauren, there are no accidents. Hi, Karen Peterson. Hello, and welcome to Citizen Dame, the podcast where we talk about why women are awesome and men need to learn that that is true and it's not scary. I am Karen Peterson, joined as always by my amazing co-host, Lauren Humphreys Brooks. Yay! Hello. Hello. How are you doing, Karen? <laughs> I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. It's been yeah. a... It's been a week, but I feel like it's always been a week, so. It really always has been a week, hasn't it? It's, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, this is because being a woman is so terrifying, so. It is. It is. I mean, like, I just, like, live in constant fear. That's, can we talk about that for a minute? I think <laughs> like, you before, because people before are like, we... what is going on? Before we go into, you know, the our actual topic for today, like, I... I don't, I don't understand men. And I, and so many of them think that this is like a really feminist perspective to take that being female is terrifying. It's just like, well, it is and it isn't. I mean, there are lots of scary things about being a, a woman. Like Most I'm looking at related to men. I'm just saying. Yeah. It, well, exactly. It's like the problem for the most part is men, <laughs> <laughs> but you know like but just my day-to-day -day life as a a female presenting individual is not particularly terrifying I mean I yeah I have to be aware of my surroundings I definitely have more of a sense of like m my own vulnerability sometimes but for the most part I just you know kind of live my life and and the and the thing that so many men seem to be terrified of are exactly the things that women aren't scared of right. it's things like oh your period it's like no one is afraid of their period like no one is now some of us experience periods in a really bad way and that's not fun but by and large women are not frightened of menstruation because it's something that we do constantly exactly well not constantly because that's one of not the constantly. things men get wrong <laughs> i think it's we also always happening do um, not have control over it we do not get to choose when when we menstruate and when we don't like and it's... also the fact that we do does not make us less safe when handling nuclear codes <laughs> just saying <laughs> no it just makes us like want chocolate and cry at movies exactly and I occasionally watch... get a little bit extra mad at the dumb shit you're already doing yeah I, I was watching an episode of king of the hill the other day and it's it's where one of the the characters connie gets her period for the first time and her mother says just like oh but it makes sad movies so much better you catch you watch titanic on the right day and it will blow your mind and i was like that's <laughs> that's actually true that like so accurate. like you can experience something to just like oh this is the most amazing thing i've ever seen like i can't believe how emotional i am about it and then like you watch it uh, at a at a more you know balanced time and you're like oh okay all right yep mm -hmm. and that is why you know that certain shows have female writers in the writing room <laughs> yes exactly but you know this this all comes from uh, a, a film that we're actually going to talk about today, but then we, we were discussing the way that men respond to the movie Eighth Grade, mm -hmm. which seems like neither one of us like particularly. Not so much. I mean, I think it's fine. I don't. I don't necessarily even dislike it. I just. I think there was just too much of a big deal made about it. Yeah, and and I think that it it does address a particular experience of being you know a, a girl an adolescent girl right but it really doesn't get at the full experience and and the way that some men talk about it, just like well but this is terrifying like it's like okay men have for the last three years i think that's how long ago it came out been unironically referring to it as the best horror film of that year and that's where we're just like oh my gosh and like 
it was funny the first time I saw someone say it, like, because I knew that they were joking. But then people jumped onto it like, yeah, this is absolutely terrifying. It's like, oh, my gosh. No, just just no. Stop. Stop. Well, and first of all, it isn't terrifying. I mean, there, there's oh. one scene. There's one scene that's really disturbing, right. um, and actually, it was one of the scenes that I really did not. It was one of the reasons why I really did not like the film because I mm-hmm. think that the film gets a lot wrong, actually, about being that age yeah. as a girl. Um, which is not saying that that does not happen to girls, but it, it just it makes it into. I, I've I've said before that I feel like there are a lot of men who believe that the female experience is nothing but suffering. And that that's all that it's really about. And, you know, the world is terrifying for women. It's just like, yeah, you know what? I fucking know that. I don't need some dude to tell me that. And I definitely don't need to see it repeated over and over again. I want to see, you know, day-to-day lives of women actually being represented at the same time to actually be like, oh, there's a lot of joy in it too. Mm-hmm. Right? And, and it does come down to, there is this misogynist undertone in a lot of it where it's like, well, thank God I'm not female. Like that's really what it's coming down to. So this is so scary. Thank God I didn't have to go through. It's like, yeah, that's what you, you, you are, you are afraid of being female. You're afraid of women basically. Yeah, yeah exactly. And of course we'll talk a little bit more about this later. And the, the reason this is all coming up now I mean, like I said, the movie came out, what, three years ago. But the reason this is all coming up now is because it's a lot of people are referencing it again in reference to the movie Turning Red, which is available this weekend. It's now on Disney+. Plus, and we are going to talk about how great of a film that is. <laughs> um, I think we both agree on that. Spoiler alert. Um, but we're going to talk about that a little bit down the road. We're going to um, spend some time today talking about the Academy Awards, which are in two weeks, and I can't believe it's already here, and I can't believe it's finally here. (laughs) You know, it's like kind of that weird time of the year. But uh, what we're going to do this week, and I think next week too, is talk about women and the Oscars. And so today I thought it would be fun to, um, to really go into some of the history of female directed films and um what the the stats look like which of course we know they're bleak but um really diving into some of that so a couple of years ago i actually wrote a three-part series when i was still with award circuit um r.i.p award circuit and it, i really dove deep into all of the categories of the academy awards and, and the history that women and female directed films specifically had done things like in the entire history of the Academy Awards. And mind you, we've now had like two or three additional ceremonies since then, since I wrote this and it's still zero. Um, how many female directed films have been nominated for visual effects, Lauren? I already just I have the answer. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> many, yeah. uh, zero. The only, and so there is a little bit of an asterisk on this one because the only time that it's ever happened was The Matrix in 1999. And the reason I say that gets an asterisk, the Wachowskis are women. There is no questioning that. But at the time, we did not know they were women. Yeah, they they were not openly, they were not out. Right. So that's why technically um, a female directed film has been nominated for vet for best mm-hmm. visual effects, but also technically it hasn't happened. <laughs> so it's like a weird, they are 100% women, but the Academy didn't know at the time. And as we saw this year, now that they do know, Matrix Resurrections got totally shunned. So there you go. Anyway, uh, so I have a couple of other fun little yeah. trivia questions for you. What was the first, sorry, who was the first female director nominated for an Academy Award? Or Best Director, or... Nope, just nominated for an Academy Award. Just nominated for an Academy Award. Um, Oh, was it... I'm looking at them. (laughs) But it doesn't say what they were nominated. So it would be Dorothy Arsner, wouldn't it? Nope. Oh, no, Wanda... I have the categories. It's the title of the film, and then the director, and then the categories that they were actually nominated. Okay, so it was Wanda, Wanda Jakubowska. Yes. Yes, for the C. Yes, which was a short film in 1933. 
Mm-hmm. Who was the first female director to win an Academy Award? Uh, oh, um, was it Wendy Choi? Nope. She, she didn't was win? also nominated. She did not win. Yeah. Uh, I don't know then. Nancy Hamilton, 1955, for the documentary Helen Keller in Her Story. Ah, okay. Oh, yes, you have it highlighted. See, I'm confused. I have the winners highlighted. I'm confused by your by your system because there's no key, Karen. I can't find a key. I, sorry, I originally just <laughs> made this for myself. I had never uh-huh. intended on sharing it with people. And then a couple people asked to see it. And I was just like, well, this makes sense to me. It wouldn't, like, obviously it would make sense to everybody. So, yeah, no, the winners are highlighted. <clears throat> All right, so I do have I do have a cheat sheet. I just like can't read it. That's all. <laughs> there you go. All right, so what was the first female directed film nominated for best picture? Female directed film nominated for best picture. Oh, um I don't know. It was not Seven Beauties. No, yeah, I was about to say Seven Beauties, but I think there was one earlier than that, wasn't there? Nope, there was not. It took 10 more years. So Seven Beauties was in 1976, nominated for four Academy Awards. Uh, but the first film nominated, or yeah, nominated for Best Picture that was directed by a woman was Children of a Lesser God in 1986. So 10 years Jesus. later. Yeah, Miranda Haynes. Mm-hmm. What is the most nominated film directed by a woman? I have no fucking idea. <laughs> is it like is it like the Hurt Locker? It or is the like Hurt Locker. That? Yeah. All right, yes, got one, got okay. one. I'm trying to read through your spreadsheet, just like is it? It's the Hurt Locker, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it's the Hurt Locker. And what is the uh, most nominated film directed by a woman that did not win Best Picture? For Christ's sake. Mudbound? <laughs> uh, no. Nope. Lady Bird. Nope. Nope. Mm-mm. All right, then I don't know. It was The Prince of Tides in 1991. Ah. Nominated for eight Academy Awards, won zero. And Best Director was not one of them. Oh, sorry. Out. It was nominated for seven, not eight. Lead actress, lead actor, art direction, cinematography, original score, adapted screenplay. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All of that, but it's director, nothing. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. because she's also because it's Barbara Streisand and, you know, Barbara Streisand obviously can't direct a movie. <laughs> of course. Of course. Yeah. Even though she had two films that were nominated for multiple Oscars, the other one being Yentl in 1983, which got four uh, nominations it won for original score so yeah there you go so wow. uh so yes yeah, so we um oh and another fun fact i won't make you look this up but another fun fact is going back to the matrix um which you know again we didn't know they were women at the time but it's the only one it's the only film d- directed by women that won all of the awards it was nominated for editing sound sound effects and visual effects oh yep uh yeah so all together and okay i only i haven't completed the spreadsheet um for all of the 2020 nominees or for the 2021 and i think i told you the wrong number the other day but as of 2019 we finally crossed 300, 300 films directed by women that have been nominated for an Oscar in any category. And to put that in perspective, there have been over 4,000 films nominated for an Oscar. So women, female directed films don't even make up 10% of the total. Mm. So, yeah. So why do we well, as women care about the Oscars? <laughs> Well, I was going to say, but Karen, doesn't this just mean that, like, those films have not really deserved to be nominated? <laughs> Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the merit-based system, shall we? <laughs> well, I think that one of the first things you have to note is that women were locked out of Hollywood filmmaking for in a lot of ways. Yes. 
Um, and, and the Oscars, although obviously, you know, I think we're going to talk about this. Obviously, the Oscars are not solely for Hollywood. Um, they don't solely award Hollywood produced films, but because women were locked out in so many different ways, um, having female directed films for a long period was less likely, basically. So, so just by demographics, right, you were going to get a lot more men nominated for things. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, and to that point, so the Oscar, the very first Academy Awards were in 19, well, they were in 1928. They celebrated the films from 1927 into 28. They had um, very different cutoffs back then. They weren't from January to December. And so the first couple of years, it's like 27 and 28, 28, 29, 29 and 30. But anyway, um, so the very first time that a film directed by a woman was nominated for any Oscar was 1930. So this would have been the third Academy Awards. And that was lead actress for Sarah and Son. Ru uh, Ruth Chatterton was nominated for Sarah and Son, which was directed by Dorothy Arzner. And then it took another couple of years. And we had, like you mentioned, Wanda Chakabowska uh, co-directed a short film with Jersey Zarzyski. Sorry about those names. Luckily, those folks are dead now, so it's okay. Um, this was almost 100 years ago. Anyway, uh, so then, so 1930 and 1933. It takes until the 50s until it happens again. And you have a couple of short films, and then in 1955 is the first time that a female director won, and that was Nancy Hamilton. And so you just have a few here and there in, into, and now we're into the sixties and the seventies. It's, I mean, it's just the, like, to your point, the history of women and we knew women were directing films. We've talked about this a lot on this podcast of women essentially, you know, being very foundational to Hollywood. And, you know, we had Alice Guy and Lois Weber and some of the, the founding mothers of Hollywood. And mm -hmm. as soon as the, the rise of the studio system began and they started making a lot of money on these movies and they started giving themselves awards, women were effectively shut out of key roles like directing. Yeah. Well, and, and you're also looking at a period. So even the period that you're referencing, so the first one being in, in 1930, right. Mm -hmm. Post that is, is the, advent of the production code, right? Within a couple of years, you've got the production code. And, you know, we've talked about the fact that Dorothy Arzner herself got frozen out of Hollywood, basically. Yeah. Um, and part of that, it, there were a number of different reasons for that, but part of it was because of, of not just the kind of increasing power of the studio system and the, the, the big studios, but also in terms of what films were allowed to show and what they weren't allowed to show. And so women's films, right, began increasingly being made by men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so what you have then for, gosh, like, in, until you get into the 80s, predominantly when women are nominated, when, sorry, when female directed films, because there's there's lots of women getting nominated for Academy Awards. You had, um, you you know you've got music categories, you've got costumes coming in, you've got um, yeah. you've got female writers. We know Frances Marion was nominated for two Academy Awards. She was actually the first person nominated twice um, for Oscars, and so those were all happening early. But we're specifically talking about films that were directed by women, and of course the the most common category for women to get into even today is short film. Yeah. Also and, have a lot of documentaries, but yeah, it's primarily short film. Well, and, and actually, you know, thinking about it in terms of the, the Hollywood system, right. Uh, um, short films are tend to be independent films. They tend to be films that are especially, especially, you know, in the, the thirties and forties and fifties and into, into the eighties really still are. Um, that they they're not ones that are really being produced by the big studios there's no particular like reason for them to do that so you have a lot more flexibility for women to be able to get into those things and you also have a lot of um i would imagine less 
oversight coming from censorship boards, coming from uh, coming from, you know, just have studio executives and things like that, which doesn't mean that it's necessarily easy to raise money to make short films. But it does mean that you're essentially talking about American independence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that is a very good point. Thank you. So a couple of things that, that came up when we were introducing this topic. First of all, uh, Nanina, thank you, Nanina, um, linked back to a thread that she had written. This was last summer. And um, she was looking at the international feature, which is a whole other <laughs> uh, thing, separate from, obviously, from the American system. But this was also a really interesting um, little rabbit hole to go down to, especially because the first time that a woman was nominated for Best Director was for an international film. And that was Seven Beauties, Lena Vartmuller, you should watch it. It's great. But um, yeah, so Nanina, and we'll link this tweet thread on the show notes, but she said, out of 325 approximately nominees since 1947, 26 of the international features were directed by women, 10 more than Best Picture. A fact that gets obscured because the country, not the director, gets the award, which is a very important distinction. So the uh, the Academy Award for International Feature used to be foreign language film. It's gone through several different titles and things. But that's always given to the country that the film comes from. Very often and usually the director gets to be there to accept it, but they don't get to keep it unless the country wants to give it to them. But it goes to the country. And so uh, Nanina has this very helpful thread. So Astrid Henning Jensen's Pa or Boy of Two Worlds was the first in 1959, 17 years before the first woman nominated for Best Director, 26 years before Best Picture nominee directed by a woman. And then in 1976, it was Seven Beauties. And then Entre Nous from Diane Curis. And then... Um, in 1984 so we had a couple back to uh we had several back to back so 1983 is entre new 1984 is camilla which was uh argentinian that was from maria luisa bemberg then in 1985 we have agnieszka holland's angry harvest and colleen Soros' three men in a cradle which have you ever seen that it's the the movie that three men and a baby was yeah, adapted it's, from it's the original one i have ages ago <laughs> Ages ago, because I remember, because I remember my parents showing me Three Men and a Baby, and then they were like, oh, we were going to show, they would like show me, you know, the birdcage, and then show me La Cage à Faux and things like that. <laughs> um, yes. And so, and they're very different films. That's all that I remember. <laughs> I like... <laughs> we watched this when I was in, um, in high school. My French teacher would show us, you know, French versions of movies that we knew really well in the States. And this was one of them. And it was, it was funny because it's like, I mean, it's just as funny, but it's very different. So like the Ted Danson character, you know, who is like this playboy actor in the French version, he's actually a pilot. He's like got his shit together, but he's got, you know, a lot of girls hanging around him because he's a pilot, you know, and whatever. So, uh, so there's just little differences like that, but it's a very funny movie. So if anybody gets a chance to watch it, I would recommend checking it out. Uh, and then in 1988... We have the first woman of color nominated, and that is Mira Nair, Salam Bombay, which is another one that is just fantastic. And is that the one that's coming to Criterion this year, or is it's, it already on Criterion? I feel like it is. I know that they announced one of her films. It might be that one. I'm checking now because, yeah, that one already is. I think it's. I think it might be Monsoon Wedding that's coming finally. So anyway, um, yeah, so, but great, great film. If you haven't seen it, watch that one too. Um, yeah, and then, so so that happened in 19, that was uh, 1988. So then we've got another gap into the 90s now with Marlene Goris's Antonia's Line in 1995. And that was the first female-directed international feature to actually win the Oscar. 1995. That's just, I mean, you know, again, we always talk about, like, oh, that, on the one hand, it's just like, yay, on the other hand, God. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. It's just, oh, yeah. 
these kinds of things it's like it's fun to celebrate when things go right and it's like yay i'm so happy for jane campion this year i'm really really hoping that she wins the oscar and it'll be great she'll be the first woman to be she's the first woman nominated twice be great to see her win and then it's like why in 94 years why is she the first woman nominated twice (laughs) Oh, and and to the point of things like international features, short films, things like that, there is this tendency to acknowledge, or or even what we were talking about with Prince of Tides, there is this tendency to acknowledge acknowledge women's work, particularly the work of female directors, without actually acknowledging the women themselves. Right. So so you know, Prince of Tides being nominated for everything except best director. International features, women, female directors getting in an international features, but it's being recognized for the country is the one that's being recognized, not the filmmaker, right? Exactly. All, all of those kinds of things, there is this, and I'm not going to say that it's necessarily deliberate, but there is that underselling and and um, attitude towards female filmmakers generally that they are not important, right? That it doesn't matter who directed the film. Mm-hmm. What matters is the film itself, but it only, it really primarily happens with women. Yeah. Um, and, you know, God save you if you're a woman of color <laughs> um, or, or a lesbian or, you know, a trans woman or anything like that. Um, yeah. But but yeah, so so you get these these trends where you're like, oh, isn't this great that, you know, these these female filmmakers did get nominated in, in international. It's like, yeah, but they're not being recognized. Right. So I, I mean, I have to say, I did not know that a woman directed um, Three Men in a Cradle. No idea until like this moment. <laughs> I was like, mm-hmm. oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, but it's yeah, it, it's it's that kind of thing where there's this lack of willingness to acknowledge female filmmakers as being the major artists. And we talk so much about auteurs. Right. And about how important the director is. But we seem to a lot of the time award the men for their singular vision, but the women, well, it's collective. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and oh, I was going to say something and I totally forgot what it was. Cause I was looking at three different Sorry. things at the same time. No, <laughs> it's not your fault. Um, but yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think there's this weird tendency and it does, it does happen with men too. Um, I very, very distinctly, and I know a lot of people are talking about it this year as well, but I very distinctly remember when Whoopi Goldberg hosted the Academy Awards the year Moulin Rouge was nominated, and in her opening monologue, she made a joke about the costumes and the acting and the singing and how it brought all these elements together and managed to do all of that without a director, because famously, Baz Luhrmann was not nominated that year. Oh yeah, and, it, it definitely it definitely yeah. happens to, to right. especially when it comes to individual films. I'm just saying that but it's, it especially happens. Yeah, yeah. With, no, there's I a totally trend. Agree. Yeah, oh, there's yeah. a trend with not acknowledging female filmmakers specifically. Mm-hmm. Well, and and to make that point very clear, how many films directed by women have been nominated for Best Picture? Do you know? Uh, what are we up to now? <laughs> <laughs> have been nominated for oh, have been nominated for Best Picture. I do not know. So um, Clayton Davis from Variety actually wrote about this this week, and I linked it in the show notes. Um, 18. I'm looking at it right now. (laughs) 18, beginning with Children of a Lesser God and going up to this year with, um, of course, The Power of the Dog. And um, also Coda. We had two this year, and we had two last year. Um, But that brings our total in 94 years to 18. And there have been over 500 films directed by men that have been nominated for Best Picture. And um, and how many women have been nominated for Best Picture? Or how many times, sorry, how many times have women been nominated for Best Director? What are we up to now? Jane getting twice. What are we up to now? Nine? Uh, eight. Eight. Yeah. Sometimes, why did I think Nine um because it should be more than eight <laughs> should be more than eight i for some reason like i remember when because when um uh koi zao won last mm-hmm. year and for some reason i was just like oh we're up to for some reason that got we were, us to i thought seven. we were up to eight that got that, that got, got us to, to seven, seven. Jesus. yeah so it was um it was vert Mueller, campion mm-hmm. um then it was um coppola 
and then Bigelow was number four, and Greta Gerwig was number five. And then we got Zhao and Fennell, which brought us to seven. So this year makes eight with Campion being nominated again. Wow. Mm -hmm. And one of those is a repeat. <laughs> right. Yeah. Which could exactly. be. I mean, she should have been nominated. I'm not saying that she shouldn't. Oh, 100%. So. And she should win. Yeah. Um, absolutely. But it's just, just looking at that, it's like, okay, that's 10 times that m the movies have been nominated and the directors have not. It's... And I'm not sure how that correlates to how often men have not been in that category, but... Yeah, you would have to look at percentages probably. Yeah. But um but no, but I mean I think that that's that speaks with the women female directors particularly are undervalued, especially for, you know, when we're talking about narrative films. Mm -hmm. Um and I I I do kind of wonder whether there is there is also a certain kind of narrative bias um going on because women so the films that are viewed as being the kinds of films that women make, right. right? And it's it's that attitude of, you know, women are more emotional, women are more um, connected to their subjects and things like that. And that in itself would almost lend itself to making things like um, documentaries. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and not so much as being in command in the way that we view the best picture nominees or the uh, the best picture nominees and the best director nominees as being. Um, so they're not as in control of the narrative, basically. Yeah. yeah, that's very true. And that also gives more room to explore things like the animated and the live action shorts, and even the documentary shorts too. But it gives them more room to play, like what you were saying before. It's, it's also difficult to raise the financing and to get people to commit when you're doing a short film. But I think that there's more acceptance for women there because, and I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of reasons, but I think one of them is just that, um, I think people do want films that take you on an emotional journey, but there's less investment emotionally when it's a short film. Like if I'm all, okay, I'm just going to watch this for 10 minutes the experience that you have and the willingness to commit 10 minutes to a film by a woman for a lot of people is just different from two hours. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. Um, and I mean, I think we can also note, and I'm not, I'm, I'm better on the contemporary issues in connection with this than I am on some of the older, um, the older issues, but yeah. Uh, Wait, you mean you're not going to talk about things that you didn't live through and don't have <laughs> direct knowledge of? Um, well, I did talk about things that I didn't live through and don't have direct knowledge of a number of times, but... <laughs> but I um, mean, you know. Anyway. Yeah, but but in now now I don't remember what I was going to say. Sorry. Uh, oh, the, the use of short films as kind of jumping off points for directors and, yeah. for, um, and for writers, etc. We've seen a lot more men going from making maybe one short film or sometimes no short films and immediately jumping into directing, you know, getting studio assignments basically. Mm -hmm. um, and we see that a lot. And in fact, we talk about it a lot. It's just like, oh, the me this mediocre male director is getting work ahead of these very talented women. I think that there is still this attitude that women have to put in their time. Yeah. Right. But so you've got to make the short film. You've got to direct television. You've got to, you know, and and those are viewed. And I I don't think that this is right, but those are viewed as the stepping stones almost. Mm -hmm. But so many women basically don't take that next step to directing feature films, yeah. um, or if they do, they're smaller and independent films. And I think that that's very true for our contemporary period. Again, I don't know. I don't know about the 1950s necessarily, except right. that there's a lot more studio control at that time. So I think that there's a lot more of women just being locked out of certain types of films. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is like, if you, if you read up on a lot of the experiences that folks were having or just the the quote unquote glory days of of old hollywood and stuff that's very much what was happening the studio heads got to make so many of the decisions they would just you know decide this is who's going to direct this film and that's who's going to write it and it didn't matter if those people liked each other or not that they, they were working together you know and but because of the the good old boys club nature of it women were very much shut out of that. And now, as we've seen since 
since independent film really has grown since the 70s um, and become not just not just more ubiquitous, but also um, more welcoming, I think, to lots of different types of voices, then you start to see not just more films being made, but more films being recognized that are directed by women, that are directed by people of color, that just are not in the traditional you know, straight male, straight white male, um, lens, I guess is what is the word I'm looking for, but yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and those kinds of films actually being recognized by the Academy. See, see, that's the thing there, there have been, as we've noted, there have been a lot of female filmmakers over the years, right? but those films are not being recognized. They are smaller films. You know, you think about even people like Ida Lupino who basically, you know, she, she didn't work in a studio system. Right. She worked on, she did her own, basically she did her own independent films and she was very successful at it, but, um, but she wasn't working within the system in the same way that she did it even as an actress. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, even to, to the point of like this whole, the rise of the American independence, which kind of begins in the 1960s and goes through the seventies and eighties, women don't really get much of a foothold in terms of acknowledgement by the Academy uh, as, as directors until the 1970s. Right. So you're talking about a good decade in a lot of ways, even a little bit more than that, where, you know, you've got these these great filmmakers, you know, people are talking about Scorsese and Coppola and like all of these filmmakers. And there's there's still the women are still not getting it in the same way. They're still not you know, you have this opening up of Hollywood generally. But they're still not making a great deal of headway really until you get to the 1970s. And even then they're still struggling. Right. And even then as women, because that is where we really start to see the numbers climb, but yeah. even then it's still primarily in the short film categories, you've got some documentaries in there. Um, you have Barbara Copel wins for Harlan County, USA. You get, um, you get films like, um, Elaine May's The Heartbreak Kid gets into acting nominations, finally. Um, Joan Micklin Silver gets an acting nomination in there for her film, A Hester Street. Um, so you start to see more branching out of, of the, the categories, but it's still primarily in the short films and some documentaries. And then every once in a while you get like, you know, costume design. Right, yeah. Um, and, and, and again, it's not, it's not saying that those are not worthy nominations but the acknowledgement of the director really doesn't happen exactly yeah well the acknowledgement of the director and then you also when the directors are acknowledged it's it's in categories that are not not that they're not eligible but like here it is in 94 years we've still never had a documentary nominated for best picture ever yeah, yeah. well and that's and that, I think, also then you begin to get into the issues of, um, uh, like, I say, like I said earlier, narrative film bias in some mm -hmm. ways. That narrative films, at least within the Hollywood system, narrative films are viewed as more valuable yeah. um, than documentary films, even than animated films. Um, mm -hmm. You know, those the narrative live action movie is pretty much it. Yeah, so... Well, you know, you brought up uh, animated feature. Let's talk about that a little bit, because I think that is also a category that um, even for men, like it's a category that tends to be looked a little bit down on. It's becoming more and more appreciated, but um, it's still not treated the same way that that um, narrative feature films are uh, live action ones. And of course, the category itself didn't come into existence until, I think, 2000 or 2001. The first one was Shrek. That was the first winner. Um, which, by the way, direct, co-directed by Vicki Jensen and Andrew a Adamson. So the very first animated feature that won an Academy Award, co-directed by a woman. Well, and just, okay. and just going through some of the nominations um, for animated features, a lot of them are co-directed by women. Yep. Um, a lot of them, you know, have two directors and usually it's, it's very often, not, not always, but very often it's one man and, and one woman. And so women get in there, um, kind of that way, but it's, 
It's, I mean, it's remarkable. And then also you begin to get into the issues with animated features of the, the kind of Disney Pixar hegemony. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so you do get a lot of that, but, but um, you have, what's her name? Uh, Domi Shi. Yeah. Who finally won for animated short in, for Bao in 2018. Which is such a great film. I love that. It really is. But really yeah, is. but it, but even then, you know, you still have that Disney Pixar kind of dominance. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you, you know, just looking through it, and I'm not, I'm, I haven't done all of the all of the math to figure this out. But if you just look through the nominees for best animated feature, a lot of them fall into that category. And there's still, you know, the the um, the directors are still not winning it necessarily. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. A, a lot of times they get to accept it, but I think yeah. I think an animated feature goes to the producers. If just it like operates it does with feature film, yeah, or with best picture, I mean. Hmm. Yeah. Well, and and uh, of course, then we had stuff like what happened with Brave, where that's a whole yeah. a whole big mess, but. Yeah, it, it's uh, in the la- in the full in the feature length. Sorry, feature length animated films. The reign of Disney Pixar is real, and it's very dominated by male directors. Um, when you have women getting into these categories with their films, it tends to be outside of the Disney Pixar machine. Like you had um, the Breadwinner, which was directed by Nora Toomey. It's the same studio that did. Um, Wolfwalkers last year, um, G Kids um, distributed that. So, um, and then you had like Persepolis. You have some, and they're really great, but they're not—they're not given the same consideration as the films from Disney and Pixar. I mean, look at the category this year, which is pretty much all men, I think. But even you've got this beautiful movie in Flea, which is international feature. It's nominated in documentary as well and it's probably going to miss out to Encanto which is also a great yeah. movie but it's like do we even really consider these other films sorry I feel like this episode's been all over the place I have a lot to say about this and it's not very organized <laughs> <laughs> no I no I absolutely I I do agree with you and um and but I I think that this is where some of the things that we're talking about we're getting into the other issues that are attached to the Academy Awards specifically mm-hmm. and also you know again a lot of it comes down to who is allowed not only who is allowed to make what films yeah. Um, but also who is going to get acknowledged for making what films. So yeah, you do talk about things like Persepolis or um, This Year Flea, et cetera. And there's almost a given that, yeah, but Encanto is going to win. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But we kind of, you know, we sort of know almost it's, it's honestly boring. I would love to see a shakeup of it, but pretty much every single year, if you have a Disney Pixar film, um, you're just kind of like, yep, that's that's someone that's going to take it. Doesn't it almost doesn't matter, right? And so when you then also have categories that are more friendly in a lot of ways to to female filmmakers or to people of color, you're still getting this kind of dominance of the big studio films, which are ultimately going to you know they're going they're going to be the ones that went out. So they're not going to be the one the um, the films like Persepolis are not going to be the films to win, right? Um, so, uh, another f- fun fact, I don't know. Are these fun facts? I don't know. <laughs> but, um, uh, 2019. So one thing that I've been really trying to look at and, and point out, and this isn't like about trying to give people cookies, but just really recognizing that the Academy is making changes, even if they're slower than they should be. But it's been about five years since they really started to make a concerted effort to expand and broaden the membership. And um, that was something that started with, um, oh my gosh, I'm totally blanking on her name. She was the the Academy president a couple years ago. Um, And so there's been this concerted effort. Now there's almost 10,000 members. it would have gone over 10,000 this year, but sometimes people decline the invitation. Um, there's rules now about staying in the academy. You have to be so, you know, you have to be a certain level of activity and all this stuff. Anyway, so it's almost 10,000 members in the academy that get to vote. And 
that is up from about 6,000 five years ago, uh, five or six years ago. And so you can really start to see how that actually has changed the look and the overall picture of what's getting nominated. And one of the ways that you can see that is like last year was the first time that we had two women nominated for best director ever. Um, we had, you know, um, this year there's, we have more women nominated in screenplay, I think, than in any other single year ever. Um, you know, so you start to see these changes. 2019 had 13 films from female directors that were nominated for at least one Oscar somewhere. And again, of course, a lot of those were the shorts, but we also had, you know, song nominees. We had a, a couple of actress nominees. Um, we had three documentary features that were all nominated or directed or co-directed by women. And so it's like, you can really start to see the, the shift and it's great that that is happening. There's still a lot of work to do, but I think that it's important to recognize that we definitely are in a different world than we were even 10 years ago. Oh, definitely. And, and that's, that's, it's good. <laughs> like, first mm -hmm. of all, um, and there, there's also this pressure I think that is coming from from the society itself because we are beginning to recognize this more um we're beginning to talk about it a lot more you're there's a lot more discussion of the fact that you know how dare you not nominate these directors why you know why does this film get in and that film doesn't and I so I think that I don't think that there's necessarily been a great deal of pressure on the academy to start you know nominating women or anything like that but i do think that there's been a more of a recognition of an imbalance and an imbalance with no particular purpose right it's it's just like you're freezing these women out and we don't know why <laughs> like yeah. what is it about this male director that makes him better in some way than this female director other than his gender right um and and so i think that there's this kind of a, a more people are being forced to kind of confront their own biases and to begin to do something about it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think that, that as we have more um, vocal women in key positions in the academy, particularly like in the Board of Governors, we've had some really great stuff coming from people like Ava DuVernay, who've really been speaking out and like, hey, these movies are awesome and you all need to watch them. And so it's been, I think... I think a couple of things that have also changed in addition to the membership, um, there, there's been a lot more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not forced, but, uh, I mean, there's very, in order to get to vote on, on things like in the nominations, you have to have turned on the Academy portal and clicked on at least a certain percentage of the films and things like that. So it's like the rules the rules governing how you can even vote for the awards in the first place have made it so that in order to get to cast your ballot, you really have to have actually seen the movies that are submitted. You have to really interact with it. And I think that that actually getting people to sit down and watch these films has made a huge difference because then they're like, oh, huh, that actually is a good movie. Maybe I should vote for it. I'm sorry, I'm just horrified by the fact that this really does imply that there were a lot of people voting in the Academy that had not seen some or any, maybe even, of the films that they were voting for. Oh, and it's just I, like, I, ah, I saw this one movie and I liked it, so I'll vote for that one. It's just like, oh my yeah. God, like, no, we can't. Yeah. It's so <laughs> fucking arbitrary. Well, I remember the articles that came out after 12 Years a Slave won from like anonymous Oscar voters who were like, yeah, I guess I'll watch it now. I voted for it because I felt like I was supposed to. And it's like, that's a great movie. It deserved to win, but it did not deserve to win just because you felt like you were supposed to vote for it. It's like, well, my friend said that I, that it was good. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sorry. We, we mock critics, you know, sometimes for those, some of those critics being like, I walked out and then I wrote a review of it. It's just like, you can't fucking walk out of the movie halfway through and then write the review. You just can't do that. But the idea of not actually watching the film and voting for it or voting for another film because that was the only one that you saw yeah. is just... <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, look at even just with the people you know, like your friends who watch the Oscars and they're like, oh, well, this should have won. Okay, but did you see that? No. Okay, then you... 
why do you have an opinion that that shouldn't have won and this should have if you didn't even see the movie? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. But, but when you're talking about the Academy Awards and people have ballots in their hands, yes, the fact that anybody was even allowed to cast a ballot without, theoretically, without seeing anything. They could just vote for whatever. And so they were voting for their friends. And it really does, to me... Um, and, you know, I've always loved the Oscars. I've watched them since I was a kid, and I've always just been so kind of in awe of them. But look at how many films over the course of history. I mean, you and I, when we were doing our poll for what we're going to do for our bonus episode this year, and we're like, how, what is this movie? How did that win? Like, look at how many Best Picture winners over the first 93 years of the Oscars have had no real cultural, like, staying power. We don't still talk about Cimarron. When's the last time you saw someone sit down to watch Cavalcade or The Greatest Show on Earth? You know, like these movies, they were, you know, popular in the time or people liked the people who made them or whatever, but they they didn't have the cultural impact. And I think that that is something else. And it's easy to say while well, I'm still living in the time that these movies are coming out, but I think that's something else that is shifting. I think a lot of the, t- the films that are getting nominated now are films that are really going to stick around and are going to be films that we'll talk about for a long time because people are watching them. Yes. <laughs> what a novel idea. Mm-hmm. Watch, watch a film before you decide whether or not it deserves an award. Wow. <laughs> exactly. Oh God. Oh, I know. I know. Anyway. Um, all right. So, well, we did get one question, which was a fun question. And this was, um, this was from Noah. Who is your favorite Oscar host? I was trying to think about this because I was like, you know what I've realized? I can't remember who has hosted the Oscars for like <laughs> years. And there there were a couple of years, there, what? There, was it last year or the year before that they didn't have a host? And like, there've been a whole bunch of weird kind of things. I'm going to say Whoopi Goldberg. I've, I always liked watching her. I think that some of that is because, um, you know, she hosted a lot of Oscars that I remember watching because I was the right age for them. Uh, but yeah, I, I always enjoyed her. And I think that she had a nice balance between the humor and the jokes and kind of the gentle mocking, but it wasn't too much. It was never like, ah, oh, we're going to, you know, blow up the Oscars or anything like that. There's just something very kind of nice and fun about the, the hosting that she did. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And I mean, I enjoyed the heck out of the years that Billy Crystal did it like in his heyday. Um, it was a lot of fun, but yeah, I think when I think back on memorable ceremonies, memorable openings, memorable, you know, moments, Whoopi Goldberg is the one that, that comes to mind first and foremost. So, yeah. I did also enjoy when Ellen did it, but it's funny because looking back now, all anybody really remembers from that Oscars is the tweet or the selfie. And it's like, I don't even remember what year that was. I don't know who won. <laughs> But Listen, Bradley Cooper was in that. I know that he was. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's about all. And so is Meryl Streep. And Meryl. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a few problematic people in that picture too, if memory serves. But, um, but yeah, but when I think about Whoopi, it's like I remember the costume changes. I remember the trapeze. You know, I remember all these things specifically from, from her. And it's like, oh yeah, that was the year of Elizabeth. That was the year of the of Moulin Rouge. You know, or whatever. So, fun stuff. Yeah, well, as, as we talked about last week, um, that, that sense of the Oscars as an event, I guess, mm-hmm. was particularly with people like Whoopi Goldberg and Billy Crystal, there was more of this like, ah, this is, you know, there's, I don't necessarily say classy, but there was something like, oh, this is an event that I spend time watching, then I sit down, you know, you have the Oscar party, whatever. Um, whereas more and more, it's felt like a chore. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, I gotta watch the Oscars now. Yeah, it's become less fun. It's become something that's like, well, it's on. It's gonna, yeah, it's gonna be there. So, um, and I think a big part of that was was when they had these hosts that we looked forward to seeing. You know, like Billy Crystal would come back year after year. He did it several years in a row. When he would take a year off, then you'd bring in someone like Whoopi Goldberg, who everyone knew and loved, and and was you know pretty universally, um admired and so it's just 
it's just different. And now it feels like there's this kind of this attitude of like, we're, we're going to use, we're going to plug a hole instead of, instead of like, we're going to turn this into an event. Like, I know that there was a cover story about, um, Amy Schumer, but it's like, I haven't really seen much of anything for, I, I, like, honestly, right now I'm totally blinking on <laughs> the three hosts are. It's uh, Amy Schumer, Wanda Sykes. Wanda Sykes, yeah. And there's a third. <laughs> I there don't is a third. Regina, Regina Hall, I believe. It's Regina, Regina Hall. Hall. I think so. <laughs> I think. Am I crazy? It is Regina Hall. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's just. Oh. See, they haven't done enough to turn this into an event. Like, I understand that the three of them are supposed to be doing a separate hour each. They're not going to be technically hosting together. But it's like, why aren't these three ladies everywhere together? Why, you know? Yeah, that, that's the thing. The The grouping seems so odd. Like, just like, I don't associate these these three people with each other. Mm-hmm. I don't have any, you know, I think we, we joked the Barb and Star should host the Oscars. But I'm I was down for <laughs> I need that needs to happen like that would I would tune in just for that I would not care who the nominees were and these ladies are all great they are but it's just there's there's been no real like I'm looking at a picture right now on variety it looks like it's photoshopped it does not look like these three actually sat for this photo together (laughs) you know and it's like what what's going on there you know what why why are we doing this there needs to be more of a feeling of like we're really excited for these three ladies. They're really excited to share this duty. You know, it just, it's been, it's been very odd. So anyway, yes. yeah. Well, and and I guess that there, there was, I don't know whether this rumor was ever substantiated, but there was a rumor that they had asked Steve Martin, Martin Short and um, uh, Selena Gomez to do I it. But they know some stuff about that, that I can't talk about on here. I'll, I'll fill that in for you after. <laughs> well, what, what I had heard was that they had basically asked too late and that everyone was like, no, we're busy. <laughs> Essentially, we can't do it. We'll say that that is partially true. All right. Mm-hmm. There was also someone else that they were going to approach, but then they backed off when that person ended up in the middle of a little bit of a controversy. So... <laughs> I'll tell you more about that one off air as well. Alrighty. It's going to make you really sad. So screw you listeners. You don't get to find out this hot goss. So. DM me and I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Well, um, really quickly before we wrap up. So that's going to, that's, we're going to stop talking now about the first 94 years of the Oscars. And let's talk about the animated feature winner for 19 or for, sorry. For the 95th Oscars. I was going to say for 1922. Yes. In 2023, (laughs) this is the film that's going to win animated feature. And that is Turning Red from Disney and Pixar. Um, Lauren, why don't you start off with your thoughts first? I I loved it. Uh, You know, I'm just going to, I'm basically going to echo what most other people have said about this film. You know, one or two not terribly notable exceptions. Um... It's, it's funny. It is, it, it feels so one of the things I really like about it is that it, it, the story feels so specific to, um, to Toronto and especially to the Chinese American or the Chinese Canadian community in Toronto. At the same time, it is so universal and that's what makes it so good. You know, you've got um, these very specific cultural markers. And at the same time, you have this very universal experience, but being accepted and about going through puberty and about, you know, the pressures that you feel from your parents and being an adolescent and how messy and weird and like utterly creepy it is. And one of my favorite moments, and this was the point at which I was like, I like this movie a lot, was when um, the main character, uh, May, begins to draw the boy in her her uh, her notebook <laughs> and then suddenly just has a nervous breakdown like she's suddenly just like oh my god what's happening like it's like she goes she starts going through puberty at that specific moment <laughs> and it's just like I know that feeling that sense of like what is going on what do I do oh my god I'm just gonna crawl under my bed and never come out like it is that sensation of like What's happening to me suddenly? 
Um, <laughs> yeah. And and it and you know and the use of the the giant red panda as kind of symbolic of that messy, crazy, bizarre thing that you're supposed to be able to control, but also you're an adolescent girl and no, you can't control it, um, and you really shouldn't. And and I I really liked that. I I liked I loved all of the the different depictions of female friendships, the depictions of you know her relationship with her mother. Um, and the other women in her family, uh, this this whole idea about like using also the the panda as as kind of a metaphor for for go for being on your period and that experience. I think that this is the first um, kids film that I've seen that actually makes reference to things like like sanitary napkins and pads and um tampons and things like that i've never seen them in a kid's film before ever yeah they're like she's actually like like there's actually discussion of that Uh uh-huh right it's just like oh you forgot your pads and that sense of mortification when your mother is like trying to be helpful and is not (laughs) being helpful you're just like i want to die i am going i will never show my face again (laughs) Because mothers have gotten to the point where that stuff's no big deal and they forget what it felt like when it was a big deal. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, I, I said last night to my mother, um, cause I was recommending the film to my parents and, and I was just like, mom, like the scene where she realizes that her daughter might be on her period is just like, oh my God, this, oh my God. <laughs> and my mom is like, yeah. yeah, but did she like give her daughter a hug and tell her that she's a woman now? I was like, no, she did not. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah so what were your feelings about this i mean i i i 100 recommend it i loved it um i love the depiction of her friends mm-hmm. and that relationship and how important that relationship was absolutely i think that the 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 way that it's drawn the animation is so spectacular that it really is able to tell you certain things without having to tell you and i think that's one of the things that made this so great like Getting to see the way she reacts around her friends. The way their eyes change into those, like, anime, like, cute little, like, watery eyes that are so funny when they... Oh, my gosh. I've, I'll never look at a box of kittens the same way. Um, <laughs> that was so funny. But then also things like um, when she's starting to become kind of sullen and withdrawn and not wanting to talk to her mom. And the way it shows how her mom is really trying to push and, and freaking out because... She gets this, um, you know, this less than happy response, but then it shows what's happening in May's mind of like, oh no, I'm panicking, you know, and it's like, she's giving her mom one word answers, but it's because of what's going on in her head. She can't really say more. So I think that just the way that it expresses the experience of being a teenager, um, being a girl specifically, but just being a teenager and being really awkward and having so much going on in your mind that you just don't know how to process yet Mm -hmm. is just, it's really, really well done. This is clever. It's funny. It's very creative and imaginative. And as much as it is, like you said, very specific story, it's also very universal story. Yeah, well, and it's what Pixar is really good at. Pixar is really good at, um, and they, they have been for years, at taking very specific stories. You know, Toy Story is very specific. Yeah. But making making these universal statements and making this this kind of thing just like yes i have felt this mm-hmm. right yes i remember and it, and some of it is kind of almost nostalgia but it's that experience of being a child being an adolescent being yeah. a person right and and suddenly being like yeah so even though this might be a movie about you know a a, a music teacher who dies right <laughs> or a bunch of of toys and growing up you know this, it's still that that sensation of being very universal and um, and that's what good movie that's that's what good films are really they're very personal and they're very universal at the same time. Yeah, uh, I I also really liked that experience of the transition that feels very sudden when you're a kid mm-hmm. from being a child to being an adolescent, and it is like that's why I loved that scene so much. It is almost like flipping a switch. Like suddenly it's just like suddenly things are happening and they're different than they were. And that includes, you know, the sullen one word answers to your mom and your your parents being like, what's happening? Like, what's going on? You were you were this way yesterday and now you're completely different. Um, and, you know, watching it, I was just like, oh, puberty. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, I loved it. I loved it, too. So well done. So, so great. Yeah. 
So highly recommend it. It is uh, on Disney Plus. It is not in theaters, even though it really should be. But, you know, at least you can watch it at your house. And at least they're not also trying to charge $30 to do that either, I guess. Yes, so. I was happy about that. I, I actually was really happy about this because I can recommend it to a whole bunch of people. Yeah. And and be like, yes, you should definitely watch this. And it's on Disney Plus, so you could just turn it on right now, literally. Exactly. And there is an end credit scene, so let the credits roll. Fast yes. forward, whatever. Watch <laughs> it all the way to the end. <laughs> All right. Well, any final thoughts before we wrap things up? Nope. Watch more movies as always. Yep. A lot Watch. of a lot of good things on streaming right now. So many. Yeah. Yep. We do have our recommendations every Friday on Instagram too. So if you're not following us on Instagram, you should check that out. Um yeah. So, and our Instagram and our Twitter are at Citizen Dame Pod. I'm going to mix things up this week. We're in a change order. Uh, so, yes, yeah, <laughs> so you can find out what we say. If you want to know the tea on what I know about the Oscar house, you can DM me and I might tell you. Um, we also have lists on Letterboxd. That is at Citizen Dame. And you can see some of the great Oscar movies that we think you should watch and stuff like that. Um, we do have our website. There's stuff coming to the website, reviews and, and things. That is citizendamepod.com. And if you'd like to support the show, we have lots of different ways. Uh, we do want to thank our patrons who are just amazing. We have a new patron this week, too. So special thanks to Adriana, Ali, Brian, Connor, Estefania, Heather, James, Kathleen, Cariotta, Mason, Matt, Michelle, Monty, Nanina, Robert, Robert, Steve, Sharon, Tao, and Will. Thank y'all so much. If you'd like to join them and become a patron yourself, that is patreon.com slash citizen dame. And doing so gets you access to the episodes early. You get bonus episodes. We have some events coming up. We're uh, still working on the, the um, bags that we're going to be sending out to everybody. Um, just fun little welcome packs and, um, and more stuff along the way. So uh, it's a fun club to be in. We also have our Zazzle store, zazzle.com slash Citizen Dame Pod. There's going to be some new Oscar-themed stuff coming up this week, so look out for that. And we have our Ko-Fi, ko-fi.com slash Citizen Dame. Did I say this Zazzle store? Zazzle.com slash yeah, you... Citizen Dame Pod. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Oh, this is why I should never go out of order. Anyway. <laughs> you screwed yourself over on this one. <laughs> I totally did. All right. Well, you know, I'm just, this is... This episode is a perfect representation of how my brain works most of the time. I'm all over the place. I have a lot of really good thoughts, but I can't keep them together in any coherent order whatsoever. Lauren, why don't you tell folks where they can find you on the internet? I'm on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd at LH Business. And I am on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd at Karen M. Peterson. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Bye. Four times coming to Toronto! What? Ah! 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 Shut up! It's me! It's me! Calm down, right? I'm gonna let go, and you're gonna be chill. Got that? <laughs> chill. May? Are you a werewolf? No! What? <laughs> He's a red panda! Sick. You're so fluffy! You're so fluffy! I've always wanted a tail. Free up. Abby, quit it. May, what the heck happened? It's just some, you know, inconvenient uh, genetic thingy I got from my mom. I mean, it'll go away. Eventually. Maybe.